Well, good morning, everybody. And just a reminder, we'll get started in a minute or so. We're just going to give people a chance to get logged in. Thank you again for joining us. All right, I see a critical mass, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm Jeanette Brown. I'm the Senior Director at SCAMP. Today is our last workshop in our Asset and Property Management workshop series that we've been doing this summer. So check out our YouTube channel for all the past sessions. And today we're covering important soft skills to improve your ability to effectively manage managers, a really important topic. So our instructor is Angel Rogers. She's the Director of Learning and Development at National Core one of our largest nonprofit developer members. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to Angel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all doing well on this uh, lovely Tuesday morning. I can't believe it's the end of August already. I, every year, I think the summers are shorter and shorter. Um, but so it, it does uh, lead to our, our last uh, uh, in the series of the PM uh, webinars. Um, but it has, I think this is such an amazing topic and I, I really wanna share some ideas that I have and some things that we're utilizing here. This is really, this is, this is another one of those topics where you don't go, oh, I learned this, check the box and I can keep going. This is ongoing skills like the, the emotional intelligence uh, class we did um, last month. And it's so important to recognize that our managers, you know, how are how are we managing our managers? To me, I think this is a really important topic. So I was so happy that I, I'm able to present it uh, here today, um, especially since our managers are so vital to us. So let's start by just saying, you know, this is a great quote. Am I dreaming? Has the worm God mad or have I? So let's just all just kind of in a moment, just take a deep breath. And what what are we so mad about? You know, when you look at the world right now, I feel like it's so easy at the snap, at the drop, anything, we can just get mad super easy. It seems like we've had some, some um, paradigm shifts on, on, on the ways we're thinking about events that happen in our lives. I mean, I can tell you that already today, I was mad about traffic. And I was mad because yesterday everybody stayed home and it was a breeze to get to work. But today... It was crazy. So I was a little mad about traffic and I sat in that for a minute and sat back and said, you can't change it. You know, you can't change it. So there's no reason to be mad. But I feel that, I mean, it's, it's so easy to go to mad first. And I think that, and I know that with our uh, community managers and the different managers in our organization, that the managers are dealing with a lot of mad people right now. And I, because of that, that might be causing some challenges for them as well. So that's why I thought it was important that we spend a few, you know, just an hour really concentrating on how to recognize, how to, uh, to help our managers and what we can do as the leaders to help them and, and to help them understand that, that the world, it's a big place. And right now it just seems like it's gone mad. So managers matter, managers matter, and managing the managers matters. It's a very important part of your organizational behavior and the culture of your uh, company. Um, more is expected from managers than ever before. And when you think about this, especially for those of us, well, all of us here are in affordable housing, our managers are expected to manage the physical asset, as well as stay in compliance, as well as be ready for a react, as well as to make sure that the, the residents are, um, you know, managing their residency. There is so much on our managers and they're short staffed, most of them. And the way our deals are written, many times there's one or one and a half, two people at the most working on these sites. So our managers, there's more and more expected of them. Um, from a leadership perspective, 
managing those managers is even more important than ever. We can't afford to have vacancies in these um, particular uh, positions because if anybody in this call knows how hard it is to fill a position these days, it makes it even you know, more important that we manage our managers and make sure that they are taken care of. And remember that managers do have an incredible influence on that team performance. So what I wanna do is I wanna start with just a little exercise. Nobody has to share anything unless they want to, but I want you to just sit for a moment and think about the best boss you ever had, the best manager you ever had. And I want you to think why your why was that person so amazing to you? And what did they do that made you feel better about your work? And what did they do to make you feel valued, to give you more confidence, and to give you the competency that you need and appreciation? Let's think about that for just a minute. And how much did you learn and grow professionally while you were working with this particular person? What was the environment with that leader? And how did it make you feel? Which is an important part of being in management is still having to feel. Keep in mind that an employee's immediate supervisor, regardless of the level, this is the person that has the single most important and underutilized resource for boosting engagement. So I want you to think about that. Um, think about that best boss and, and are you emulating what that manager did for you? And are you able to bring that to your teams every single day? Are you able to do that? Uh, for many people, the quality of the relationship between the individual employee and their immediate supervisor is going to be the single most important driver of engagement. I'm going to say that several times throughout this hour. This is where we find our level of engagement. Also understanding and acknowledging that um, at the same time in a hectic day-to-day -day schedule, it's the development of those relationships that often are shortchanged and take a backseat. So I wanna make sure that you, I, I, everyone, we're all on the same page here. This is a really important topic and everyone's really busy. And so sometimes we're not able to bring our best selves to the people that we're developing. And, and managing. So I do have some things in the chat here we're going to look at. Okay, thank you everybody for, for looking along again. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you have questions, just put them in the chat, please. Um, is anybody else having audio issues? I mm, Okay, I think I might be, mm, we're good now. Okay, so someone said um, that their uh, their manager truly Trusted, I listened to them, truly trusted. Let me run your areas of focus. That is so um, incredibly important. Absolutely. Thanks, AJ. Um, she provided support and guidance that helped me become confident in my job. That is so amazing. Um, learning from unprofessional managers that I learned my biggest lessons. April, no kidding, no kidding. Um, that's, that's, you know what, that's a good indicator. Actually, you know, on a side note, when I am training new leasing consultants, I have them go shop other properties so that they can learn how not to do leasing too. So I think that that's, that's actually a very um, spot on observation. Um, Erica says, my manager took the time to learn how I learned. Ooh, we're going to talk about that and provided support and training. Very good. Great engagement, you guys. Yes. Think about that manager as we move forward with everything we're talking about today. You know, the bottom line, the way your organization manages managers matters. And I found this uh, quote in an article that says, treat managers as valuable people with skills rather than as people with valuable skills. So putting the people first is the whole intent of that quote. So I'm going to say it again. And again, we will send this to you. I will make sure that this gets sent to Jeanette and she has a copy of it for you. But treat the managers as valuable people with skills rather than as people with valuable skills. I absolutely love that. So how do we start looking at, um, uh, looking at what Heather's saying? Yes. Yeah, it isn't just your supervisor. You're right. It can be the company you work for and the culture you work for. So that's a, that's a great uh, point as well. 
So I want to look now at what, what might be happening uh, with some of the managers that you have uh, in your midst. So there could be a point where they are going through blahs or through burnout. So when you look at burnout, it's a loss of, loss of interest and motivation that can result from pressures in the workplace. Um, and there's different levels. And that's why we call it, is it the blahs or is it burnout? And I want to kind of dissect that a little bit today so we can kind of get an idea of maybe where our teams are sitting in this. Um, again, you know, coming back from maybe an all remote uh, position, going back into the office. I mean, the remote position was probably having some, some burnout with work-life balance. And now going back into the office might be causing burnout because of traffic and dealing with everything else we haven't dealt with for so long. So again, there's a lot of different levels of what people are looking at when it comes to the difference. Are you just blah or burnout? Um, because higher performance obviously is going to require higher responsibilities. And with, with those higher responsibilities can, and it can lead to a loss of interest if there's so much pressure. And um, that can result, uh, you know, with those workplace pressures can result in people uh, not wanting to do their job and not understanding the why behind it. Um, burnout um, leads to, can lead to uh, diminished performance and it can lead to depression. And the most important thing about it is that it is contagious and it can spread very, very easily amongst the entire team. So that's why we want to kind of put a fine point on it today and, and make sure that you act early so that you can ward that off. Because one of the most contagious things in a work environment are people experiencing burnout because they're going to take everybody down with them. That's part of the burnout syndrome, right? Is taking everybody with them. So you may or may not know what the symptoms are in burnout. So I wanted to, to indicate, you know, give some, some information on that. So some indicators that you might be working with somebody who is experiencing burnout could be a lack of motivation. And when we look at this, you might have somebody who was previously enthusiastic, very excited about their job, and then you watch that enthusiasm and excitement kind of dim a little bit. Like I, I call it, the lights are dimmed. Um, and sometimes those lights get dimmed because of the pressures, lots of different reasons, but you need to be able to see what those indicators are. And the first one is lack of motivation. They might be at the point where they're saying to themselves, what's the point, right? What's the point? I can do this project. I can finish X, Y, Z. No one's going to notice it or they're not going to say anything to me about it. So what's the point? If there's not consequences for not getting it done, what's the point? And that question, when somebody starts asking themselves that question, is going to lead to those feelings of being overwhelmed and being pressured and no one's noticing or appreciating. So one of those first indicators is lack of motivation. The next one is pronounced negativity, um, complaining, um, or being cynical. Um, you know, um, combined with um, predictions that every, like the Eeyore syndrome, like we talked about in the last um, session that we had, um, that pronounced negativity. It could be about, you know, anything from bad luck to um, maybe not getting um, an increase that they were looking for or not getting the seat at the table they were looking for. There's all kinds of ways that, that people will, will take one, if they're in that burnout stage, They'll take something, it could even be a very small seed, but they plant it in a, in a mind that's already compromised, with their, their positivity is compromised, and it becomes even greater. And so that could be an indicator of burnout. And you might even be one of thinking about if you've done any of these yourselves, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie here. I admit when I was creating this session, I was like, oh, as I'm typing things in, I'm thinking, ah, oh, I've done that. Oh no, I've been that person. Yikes. I got to find my, I got to get, I got to get my uh, lights not dimmed anymore. Right. So think about, you know, how this might be affecting you as well. Um, the next burnout indicator could be a loss of creativity. So for um, employees who want to solve problems on their own, might now be asking for direction, or they might not feel comfortable making a decision where they're asking you for your, for your guidance every step of the way. Um, this is something that this one, when I start to feel this within myself, I know that this is when it's time for me to take some time off or to do a reassessment. 
because one of the greatest joys I have is creating new sessions and presenting those sessions. And when I'm like, eh, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> that for me is definitely an indicator of burnout because it's very rare in my life. I don't have something to say. So for me, I know that that's one of my indicators and I can go back and figure out what I need to do to, to make that burnout go away. And then the last one on this slide is about chronic lateness or absenteeism. Um, when you see somebody who's been very responsible in the past um, and, and you know lately they are late or they're, they're absent or there's more and more days where they need to work from home. Um, I, I, I have this idea here that you kind of need to sniff around and see what's going on. That might be an indicator of burnout. There might be an indicator of other things happening that you're not aware of. So you want to really pay attention um, to all of these different burnout indicators. Okay, there's somebody in the chat. I'm going to check after each slide if there's a new chat. Oh, Tony, that's so interesting. I just had a session yesterday on ethos and culture. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we did that yesterday here. All right. Um, the next one we want to talk about is look for the source. So the first slide was talking about the indicators. Now we want to try to find out what the source of the burnout is. So if you suspect burnout, try to understand the source where it's coming from. You know, that's again, you'll usually hear me talk about peeling back the layers. Well, this is peeling back the layers. So I want to explore this one a little bit. This is one of my least favorite words in, in my vocabulary, and I try not to use it um, because I just don't, it just makes, it's just a sad word to me. But maybe you have somebody who's disappointed about the way something turned out. Um, uh, maybe an opportunity for advancement went to somebody else. Maybe you've had an office relocation and they didn't get the prime seat that they were thinking about. I mean, things as silly as where you sit are really not that silly. You know, it might, you might come across, you might be on the surface, it might seem like it's not a big deal, but for many people, that is an indicator of where they are in the company, right? So there might be some disappointment with that. So disappointment is something you have to kind of uncover, try to see if this is what's happening. There can also be some uncertainty. Um, change in the workplace is normal. It is definitely normal. And I'm going to use an office move as, as an example because National Corps recently went through a huge office move. And there was a lot of uncertainty that was uh, associated with that just because it's changed and it's something different. So um, it, it made a change in the workplace. People had to pick up all, pack up everything that they've had at their desks for years and now move it into a new location. Uh, the good news is, is that we're able to overcome that uncertainty by making the move very um, smooth and very easy for everybody to the best of our ability. And that's definitely, definitely going to overshadow those job concerns and the uncertainty that might have come with it. So, you know, that might, the, the, the root of the problem might be that they're uncertain or maybe even experiencing some anxiety. Uh, there are pressures to work faster, um, to meet stricter standards, or maybe even learning new procedures. Um, it's common these days. And I can tell you from being the director of learning and development, one of, you know, I, in order to stay up with technology and everything that's happening, I've introduced new procedures to our teams too. We went from one very uh, tried and true method to something new. And even though I understand it, I have to make certain that I'm not causing anybody anxiety by, oh my gosh, there's a whole new learning management system, or there's a whole new way to register for classes. We just got used to the other way. So that anxiety is very real, especially when you have somebody who's very accustomed to doing things the way that they, that they enjoy doing them. So that anxiety is actually very real as well. Um, how about overwork? Um, this is 2023. The way I look at that, there's a lot of there's a lot of us who are probably in situations where we feel like we may be just a, a tad bit on the overworked side. Um, this can come from a single major project, or it can be from a change in work procedures, or um, uh, some team members working harder than normal or longer than normal just to get, you know, to reach the limits that we need. So we need to be very mindful when we are creating schedules, when we're creating deadlines, that for many people, that one deadline isn't the only deadline that they have. 
And I know from being, I've been an on-site manager. So if anybody is curious as to what my background is, I came into property management as a leasing consultant. Of course, it was many years ago. We weren't called leasing consultants yet and worked my way all the way through up to this director position. Um, so I've been on site and I know that if there is a, uh, a project or a, a, a demand, I'm using the word demand, of a need from accounting, well, there might not be the understanding that there's also a demand and need from development or from HR or from IT or from marketing. And so when you look at the role of what a manager does, especially if we're looking at our community managers, they are the jack of all trades and we expect them to be the master of all of those trades. So the overwork is a very real, especially when you add in all the complexities of affordable housing. Um, there's, you know, when you, for many of us, most of our residents have to basically do a new move in every year when we recertify. So the overwork can be really daunting and can be demanding. And I think it's really easy to forget that once we get out of that place. So having that sense of empathy when it comes to being overworked becomes even more important. Um, there might be some um, people who are leaving. Uh, when people, you know, people become comfortable not only with their positions, um, but with their relationship with their coworkers and their colleagues. And this can lead uh, team members to maybe worry about some stability um, by having uh, people leave. It's, it's natural, we know that, but there can also be a sense of, you know, what's happening? Why, why are people leaving or what, what does this mean for me? And then they might even be in a position where they're in a, they have a desire to leave, that they're, it's time for them because if they feel that there's no other choice, that none of these things are getting better, that they're continually disappointed, they're uncertain about where they stand. I mean, let's stack all of this up together, shall we? They're disappointed something didn't happen for them, which has created uncertainty about where they stand. That leads to some anxiety. Now that's gonna, you know, on top of that, they have their regular workload to do with these feelings. And then one of their friends leaves and they're left going, well, why am I here? Which goes back to the first indicator of motivation What's the point? What's the point? Why am I still here when all of these things are stacking up on top of me? So again, when we look for the source, that gives us a better way to help them get out of whatever that law or burnout or just that funk that people can get in. And how do we do that? We need to smother the flames of burnout. Get how I did that? Burnout, smother, okay, yay. Anyway, we do need to smother the flames here. Your best way to combat, to combat burnout depends on the person, of course. It depends on the cause and your relationship with that individual. Um, if you have, if, as the leader, if, if you have relationships with your managers, you can, when you can approach them and say, hey, this is what I'm noticing. Let's have a conversation about this. And take them off site, take them to lunch, take them to coffee, take them to ice cream. And we're going to talk about how ice cream can pay, play a part in this later. Anyway, it is important to do that. You start sharing your feelings, you know, just listening can help. Let them share their feelings and just listening to what they're going through. You might not be able to combat any of that, but gosh, darn it. Just listening to what they're going through is a huge relief to them. They need, the managers need their leaders to hear them and they need to be able to trust them to share that. Also restore some certainty for them. Um, uh, teams, I love this, teams that, that burn out from uncertainty can, can blossom again, absolutely, as you firm things up with them. Nail down the team assignments, you know, add some fun to it, maybe add some incentives, have some fun. You know, don't let, don't let fun go away from the workplace because that's what keeps us here too. So maybe you can help restoring some certainty to smother those flames. And then maybe give them some new challenges, some new incentives, things that excite them, things that motivate them. I had, I'll just give you a, 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 an example that something happened for me a couple of weeks ago. Um, like I said, when I'm at my best, I'm creating and presenting uh, 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 and helping and really being part of solutions. That's, that's what I love to do. And I hadn't had that. I'd been bogged down by some administrative things, which we all get to at some point. 
And I realized that my creativity wasn't where I needed it to be. And just in time, I had another director approach me, another VP approach me and say, hey, I need some programming. I need, I need to help my people with understanding their role better, especially since they're all new. Is there anything we can do to prepare a program for that? I was wagging my tail. I was so excited because this gave me something new and exciting, a new program, a new project to work on. And it made me feel so good and needed and appreciated that now I am all over this and I can't wait. And I saw this and I just thought this was a perfect graphic for this. You are not your to-do list. You know that we are so much more than that. And we need to remember that with our managers. They're not just about checking boxes and getting things done. These are people with valuable skills, not just people who have skills that are valuable. So can we with, with skills? So we have to put the people first and you are not your to-do list. And I hope this is helping some. If anybody needed to hear that today, just say, yeah, needed to hear that. You are so much more than your to-do list. We all are, right? Okay. So now that we've seen the indicators, we've seen um, some of the sources and some of the things we can do to smother those flames, let's talk about some of those coaching essentials. I see something in the chat. I'm one of those people that... Um, Always have to check the chat. Oh, good, Denise. I'm glad you like that. I do too. Um, so when, now how do, how do we deal with all of these things and what can we do? Well, ask good questions and initiate candid conversations. That's really important. It can't be an interrogation that you're looking for. Why aren't you doing your work? Why don't you feel good? Why aren't you smiling? That is not going to get you very far. What we should be doing, and I don't like the word should, but really what we should be doing is asking great questions. And if you don't know what's going on, ask people, because I think that questions are the secret sauce, the magic wand, whatever you want to call it, to keep conversations fluid. You want to keep the conversations going. So how we do that is here's some examples of some great questions you can ask if you're working with somebody who may be experiencing burnout. So ask them, what would you say is the hardest part of your job? You might be really surprised at some of the answers you get. You might think that they're going to say, well, getting all these research done, where maybe they're saying, you know what, just getting my kid dropped off on time, making sure that everybody's lunches are made and getting to work might be the hardest part of the job. So these, these open up an, uh, an opportunity for conversation, not interrogation, big difference. I like this question too. If you had a magic machine to help you at work, what would what would it do for you? What would the magic wand do? What would what would this magic machine do for you? What do you wish people knew about your job? Is that a great question? Have you ever asked your managers this kind of question? What do you wish people knew about your job? Because so many times people do not understand the roles of the managers. And so it would be fantastic if you were able to, you know, be able to help them and ask them, what do you wish people knew? And then share that so that everybody does know what they wish they knew. And what does a perfect day at work look like? What a great question. What does a perfect day look like? And then is there something that you would like more training about? That's another great question, just so to keep the conversation going and not to say, hey, I think you need training in this. I would say to them, just like this, is there something else? Is there, are there any conferences or any webinars or anything that you think that you've seen that you might want to take that we can help facilitate for you? Because these should be um, considered rewards as well. So you want to keep all of that in play when you're asking these questions. And I like this graphic because I think it really does kind of enforce that. But when you're questioning for good, when you're not trying to say things like, you're burnt out, I can tell, and where's your creativity, and you're not motivated. That is going to keep people from being motivated 100%. So what you want, when you're questioning for good, you are finding out, you're learning why, you're assessing, you're going to collaborate, and you're building a conversation for better outcomes, and you're solving problems. Isn't that fantastic? So when you're questioning for good, it does make a huge difference. Yes, Robin, you needed to hear that today. Thank you for sharing. I love that. Very good. All right. So does this make sense to everybody? I just love this. I, I think I might want to um, uh, print this 
and put this in somewhere where I can see it every day so I can remind myself that questioning for good makes a huge difference rather than just questioning for the sake of questioning. All right. So what are some of the benefits of effectively managing your managers? Well, let's look at this. Um, first of all, increased team performance. Absolutely. And people management has an incredible influence on team performance. But when managers are supported well and thrive, teams benefit. I want to say that again. When managers are supported well and thrive, teams benefit. Um, data shows that managers who are thriving and receive coaching to build resilience saw a 31% increase in team performance. Teams increased innovation and burnout decreased by 52%. Wow. So see, supporting your managers, managing your managers is incredible for productivity and it's incredible to decrease burnout and everybody, everybody wins when we support the managers. Your bottom line will benefit if your managers are supported. And they need to feel the support, not just say we support them, but really feel it. Another benefit is better connections and relationships. So great managers are also great at making and facilitating connection. Um, it's often the manager or leader that helps strengthen connections within this organization. Again, when managers have high social connections, teams thrive. Um, when leaders make the social connectedness an organizational priority, then performance, productivity, and well-being go up. And as a result of that, so does something so vital to everyone on this call, I know it, employee retention. So with all of these in place, employee intention increases, which I know everybody is looking to do is to increase and make certain that they have that retention. And then the third benefit, well, there's so many, but in third, increased mental fitness. So mentally fit managers who are thriving lead teams, like I said, are 31% more effective and their direct reports are 78% less likely to leave voluntarily. Let that just sink in a little bit. And I do have all my citations at the end, all my resources at the end of this. Um, this, this is a really proactive uh, approach and this can have an incredible impact. I think that as leaders, giving your, giving your managers the, the permission to take care of themselves, the permission to take self-care as part of their repertoire is going to have a huge impact on how they feel cared for and how you show your impact on caring about them. All right, so now we wanna move into some of those crucial skills for managing managers. Oh, I have something in the chat. How can a manager, I have a question. How can a manager handle a difficult staff man man member ah, and get them more engaged? Um, you know, especially on these small properties, it can, you know, if, if this is what you're, you know, even small offices we're working in, a difficult staff member is, um, you know, that, to, be, to be fair, that's a, that's a completely different um, seminar, but to, to get them more engaged is to really uh, get to the source of why this person is being difficult. So it, are they difficult with their performance? Are they difficult with their attitude? Are they not coming in on time? Um, I think that in 2023, the most important thing a manager can do is start with empathy and then move into you know, things like, you know, I, I understand that this might be a difficult time for you, but I also need you to understand the consequences and reminding each employee how important they are and how much they matter. Because sometimes people get into the minutia of all the tasks we need to do that we forget that there are people who are doing those tasks. And so we have to remind them that that's really important. And I have I have a really cool idea for everybody at the end of this. So Manuel, hang tight. I have something I want to share with you that I think in a, in a few slides, I think you're really going to like. At least I like it enough for everybody. So I think everybody should be enthusiastic about it. Anyway, great, great question though. So some of the skills for managing managers, the first thing is, and this, this might help Manuel with some of the things that you're looking at too, is active listening. Now, obviously, I only have another 20 minutes, so we're not going to be doing a lot on active listening. That is a completely different, you know, two-hour session, but really important that we start, you know, remembering our skills when it comes to active listening. 
every leader is capable of building these skills that they need to succeed and active listening is number one. Um, it's critical that managers of managers fully understand the problems that the managers have, the roadblocks that they might see every day, as well as what their strategy is to get around those difficult situations and those roadblocks. So as a manager, you need to hear them. You need to, or a leader of your managers, you really need to listen to them and pay attention to what they're saying. The worst thing you can do is to have your phone on. I turned mine completely off. Can you believe it? Um, but anyway, um, having that, put the phone away. If you're wearing, if you're wearing it on your wrist, I can tell you as somebody, as an employee, that if I'm having a conversation with a, with another director or a VP or a, my manager, and they're they're if they're wearing it on their wrist and they start doing like this, it's like you're not checking the time, you're checking an email, you're checking a text. So I love what technology has for us. I love it. But to active listen, those things need to be put away so that you can be engaged with that. Oh, um, I have something in the chat. Our HR emphasize active listening. I, yes, we do too. It's so, such an important part. And then we have something in Q&A. Q um, how do you keep a manager, how do you help a manager gain confidence to make decisions after years of disappointment and lack of support? I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to table that one because I have this super cool idea that I want to share with you towards the end. So stay tuned. I promise I have something that I think might help you. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait to do it myself. All right. So active listening. Whoops. I missed, did I miss one? I did. Oops. Nope. Yes, I did. Sorry. I'm going to go back. Um, strategic planning and decision-making skills. Um, and I'm going to speed this up a little bit because I have a lot to share still. Um, in order to fu fully utilize the big picture thinking, then leaders have to be strategic and future focused. And we often have to make challenging decisions about where priorities uh, lie, which calls on those decision-making competencies. So we have to make sure that, that this is a skill that we're able to um, utilize when we are doing our strategic planning with our managers so that they can see we're not just thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about them and being future focused as well. Agility and re resilience, boy, these were words we've, we've all come to know and love over the past few years. Um, what I will say about agility and resilience is change is here to stay and change is also constant. And so the, you've heard it, the more things change, the more they stay the same. However, whatever analogy, metaphor, whatever you want to th think about the word change, it is going to happen. So we have to be able to lead the change. We have to put our change management hat on so that we can navigate and guide our managers through these changes as well. Um, the pace is also accelerating. Technology is accelerating beyond what I know I ever thought I'd see. And so again, we need to do this with grace and give our, our people time to um, accept this with grace too. Of course, communication skills are so important. Communication skills are a must for all of us. And um, we, we can have the best strategy, but if we're not communicating those skills to our managers, guess what? That's gonna be, that's gonna lead to disappointment and maybe overwork, all of those things that we saw those sources if we're not communicating with them. Solid communication skills are your number one way to have an impact on your managers. And then of course, inclusive leadership skills. You need to invest in building a sense of belonging with their teams. So you can't be absent. You have to be part of that team. You have to be that leader who comes in and, and rolls up their sleeves and says, what can I do to help? That's being a true leader is really, is really getting involved with that. When leadership is inclusive, here's some more statistics for you. Employees are 50% more productive, 90% more innovative, 150%, didn't even know they could do that, but 150% more engaged and 54% lower employee turnover. So I think what this is saying is that we need to get out there, roll up our sleeves and work with our managers and work side by side with them so that they can see that. The best SVP I ever had showed up to my property one day. I was the only one there, um, big property, but I had staff out. I had people had their days off. Another person, we used to go to the bank. If you guys can remember, believe that we actually used to get like our car and drive to the bank. And I was there by myself and I was slammed with people waiting for me. That SVP came in and started answering the phone for me. I'll never forget that. 
I will never forget that as long as I live. And that made me feel like I was cared for. So being inclusive with your leadership is so important. All right. So how do we effectively manage our managers? Here we go. So the first thing which is build trust and psychological safety. Uh, trust is going to trickle down from the top and we need to lead by example. Um, think of ways that you can build trust with your managers. Invest in your leadership and coaching skills. There's a difference between a big difference between a lead, being a leader and a manager. Leaders know how to effectively use coaching and utilize that skill as a, a, as a way to potentially unlock what's going on with their managers as well. Spend time getting to know your team members. Spend time. This is going to be really fun. I have a great idea, like I said. Get to know your managers as human beings. This is a very simple yet often overlooked component on effective team management. So get to know the people that you're working with. Um, offer professional development and learning opportunities, um, conferences, workshops, webinars, um, any kind of opportunity that you can give to them is really important as well. And remember to practice that future mindedness, being future minded, always looking to what we can do, the next thing that we can do to help our managers get to that level of engagement that we want them to be in. So now I, I know I went through that a little bit quickly because, in, because of time. But um, like I said, we will get you this, um, this PowerPoint should you, should you ask for it. All right, so what, this all sounds great in theory, but what if, what if we don't do that? What are some of the common challenges that we have when we're managing our managers? And I think one of the biggest ones, it didn't buy, this research did not surprise me at all, is that micromanaging. So we need to make sure that we give somebody the opportunity to grow and not to continually be over their shoulder. That, that's, there's a difference between managing the work performance and the, and the projects different than uh, managing, micromanaging. So you can check on people, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with doing temperature checks or what they're nudges as we call them now. Um, but to micromanage somebody is going to, that could lead them to burnout. And think of how demotivating that could be and how disappointing that can be. Think of all the things we've already talked about. Uh, conflict management is also another common challenge that um, not everybody has to see things the same way, but we do have to manage that conflict and know how to resolve the conflict in a way that's productive where everybody wins. We talked about that in the last um, session. Uh, gaps in communication or lack of clarity. So when I'm doing big, you know, all day or any type of session, I like to ask, is this clear or clear as mud? And I want some people, I love it when people say it's clear as mud, because then I get to go back and go over all of everything again to make sure that everybody understands what the goals are, what the strategy is, and that we have those common goals, which goes into the next one, which is misaligned goals. Maybe, maybe you have a strategy played out in your mind that your people don't know about. And as long as you can share, you should be sharing. Yes, we will send these PowerPoints, I promise. Let's see if there's another question. Oh, same one, okay, all right. So here's my big idea. And it's not just my idea. There's actually, there's actually other people who have done it before me. And when I read about it, I nearly lost my mind because I thought this was the perfect, the perfect segue for this particular topic. User manual. How about a manager user manual? So when you buy a car or a refrigerator, you typically get a manual, right? This helps you, uh, this document's gonna help you determine what you need to do, the capabilities of this, of this device, um, how to care for it, and how to troubleshoot problems. So wouldn't it be great if your employees came with such a manual? I want you to think about that for a second. The good news is, is that they can. So let's look at some of the benefits of a user manual at work. It can help you reduce surprises. When you're working with somebody new and somebody you don't know, it can take a meaningful amount of time to get to know that person. So if they had a user manual, then maybe you would be able to get to know that person quicker. How about creates vulnerability? I love this one. If the user manual consists of the right questions, um, it creates vulnerability and humility by default. Think about that one. Um, the key is to focus on the reality that each person is different and that's okay. It's not one size fits all. 
and it shouldn't be. It should absolutely be uh, that everybody's treated the way that, that, that they are managed well. It also helps you to get your know your coworkers and it gains insight into their likes, their dislikes, maybe their motivations and their work style. And it can also encourage reflection and self-awareness. I love that one. It can absolutely help you do that. And then it shows that you value the differences among staff members. So I wanna give you some prompts and some questions that you may be able to ask for your user manual. So the one might be, the first one be, what's a one fun fact about me? How fun would that to be to know about your um, team members? I'll give you one. When I was in my first year of college, I was at the University of Nevada in Reno. And in order to supplement funding for myself, I was a clown at Circus Circus. Who knew? Most people don't know that about me. So that's kind of a fun fact that I would put in my user manual. That probably explains my cheerleader-like um, demeanor. Anyway, um, another great question or prompt, what gives me energy at work? I want you to think about how you would answer these two. And with the user manual, you could probably share this with your employees, not just to have your employees share it with you. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, what's draining to me at work? And then what are my preferred communication styles and channels? Could you imagine talking to one of your employees, before you go in to have a conversation with one of your employees, flipping through that little user manual to see what's going on in their, in their head that's going to bring them uh, a, a a more satisfactory, more engaging interaction because you're using what's in their user manual. Here's a few more. I've got quite a few actually. Um, how can someone earn a gold star with me? Yeah, this might be, I, I, the, the person who wrote this, this might be a little cheesy, but I think it's a really good, I think it's a good prompt. Like what is it, what, what could somebody do that's gonna make me happy? How, how am I gonna be happy with people around me? How, how are people going to, earn a gold star. That could be anything from making sure I'm included in the lunch plans to um, when I have my do not disturb sign up, please don't ask me if I'm on the phone. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can, that you can get an answer to this one. Here's another great one. How do I like to receive feedback? How do I want my feedback given to me? Another really important things people might misunderstand about me. Good one. And then what motivates me at work? So these are all different prompts that you can use. I like, a, I've got a few more because of course I do. <laughs> um, I love this one. Um, an ideal day of work looks like this. And then my favorite, what my superpower is. What is my superpower? What do I want everyone to know that I can do? And I do it really well. And I want to share it with the people around me. I love that one. But what's also good to know is what is your Achilles heel? What is it that is your anti- superpower? What is it that makes you maybe start looking into that blahs versus burnout, you know, looking through all of the things we uh, discovered at the beginning of the hour with, you know, disappointment, overwork, anxiety, un uncertainty, all of those different things. Is that your Achilles heel, you know, it, and knowing it again, talk about self-reflection. It's a great time to be able to do that with your employees too. And I do my best work when, and then let them fill in the blank. And this is really important to know who your morning people, who your afternoon people, and you might even have evening people, but it's important to know if, if what, what time of day is best for them, because that might be the best time to have a crucial conversation with them, or even, you know, wh whatever the conversation is, when they're at their best, that they're telling you, this is the best time to talk to me. It's a user manual. So fun. And then you can also put on there, what are some of the things I love? What do I love to do? Wouldn't that be great to know this about all of your employees? Well, guess what? Well, look, before I go, there's a chat. So this is, this is interesting. What happens when you voice the ideal workday, but it gets denied? So if the, <laughs> I think that maybe you do what's the art of compromise and say, well, is there some of it that we can do? And then some of it we can, you know, what, where, where's the sweet spot? And if, if, you, if you tell them this is what I need and it keeps continually getting denied, then that's going to lead to burnout. You might even want to say, listen, I'm really trying to be a productive and happy employee here. And I have some needs that aren't being met. And I will tell you, we all know this. If we learned nothing from our moms and dads from when we were kids, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. 
So if you were to go to them with really a huge concern, you know, with about yourself and say, this would help me be a better employee. Can you help me? I'm asking for you to help me be a better employee and be a little bit on that vulnerable side. That might help. That's what I would do. Not easy, oh, not easy, but that is something I would do. I hope that helps you. So I even have some templates for you that you can look up when you get this. So um, there's a few user manuals that you can refer to if you need inspiration for this. A few things I do wanna say about this is that, um, you know, leaders, you can give a copy to each person on your staff when you're onboarding or, if, or right now, if you'd like to. Uh, once collected, the most important thing is that you don't just let it sit on a shelf and not look at it. It needs to be part of how you manage your managers. Think about, I mean, and the reason I said ice cream was an important part of this. Um, I manage somebody who loves ice cream, like loves it so much, it's almost weird. <laughs> but she loves it. So I know that when we need to do our um, you know, our once a month, let's sit down, let's see where we are, let's do some strategy, let's do some brainstorming. Guess what I'm doing? I'm taking her to get ice cream because I know that about her. It makes her happy. It puts her in a happy place and I want her to be in a happy place. Um, so again, don't just, you know, you, you might find out that someone struggles with technology, get them extra help. I have a whole big long thing to say here about this, but my time's running out. Um, you might witness that somebody might be a little bit disengaged. Well, if you look at their user manual and they say that they work best when they are working in a team setting and you've got them on a single project, that might be why they're disengaged. Um, maybe you can find out that somebody volunteers their time in the community. That would be the perfect person to ask them if they wanted to help you set up um, some kind of community relations committee, right? Um, think about this. Um, you might find out that somebody loves the Green Bay Packers. I don't know, pick a team. Um, or that they love football. And so while you're waiting for other people to come into the meeting, you can engage them talking about that. All of this leads to, and the user manual is so much fun, you guys. I'm gonna, I'm, I know my person really well, but I'm going to actually do this. I was inspired to do this by this, the research for this particular class. It's been something I've been thinking about for quite a while. But none of this works. None of this will work unless you have trust. Trust is sacred. You know what? Let them be human. We are all human. Your managers are human beings. And they're just trying to do a good job and make things happen. They're human. They're emotional. They make mistakes. They're flawed, just like you. So remember, you're managing the person, the whole person, not just the position. Protect them. Protect them from, you know, themselves. Protect them from other team members. Protect them from their colleagues. Protect them from, you know, organizational whims and changes and things like that. And protect them from you. Control your own behavior. Make sure that you're not doing anything that's going to scare them. Also make sure that that trust is there. Treat them fairly. Obviously, people deserve to be fair, or treated fairly, but that sometimes does get lost in the day-to-day -day as well. So treating them fairly means consequences should match the behavior. Help them grow. Um, managers get better at their job each day. And you want them to get better each day and develop that confidence and competence. And you do that by being inclusive, being an inclusive leader with them. You want them to be part of something bigger. I love this one. Tell your managers why what they do is important. Tell them why and that it matters, that they're, what they're doing matters to the organization and to themselves. And of course, give them a voice. Let them, let them say what they need to say, and a good manager is going to listen to that. And a good manager, a good leader is going to say, you know what, I want to help you have your ideal day. Let's see what we can do to make that happen. All right. And again, of course, the most important thing is we need to set the example. And so um, Albert Einstein said, it also says, and, and when you look this up, it also says, Albert Schweiger, Schweiger said this, Schweiger said this too, but Setting an example is not the main means of influencing others. It's the only means. So when you lead, your example is more powerful than you realize. If you want honesty from your managers, then be honest with them. If you want your managers to work hard, then you work hard. And if you want your managers to take responsibility and accountability, then you need to take responsibility and accountability as well.
All right, so I'm going to send this. I'm not going to read it all because I just I only have five minutes left, but may, well, maybe I can. Um, 10 quick ways to show your managers that they are valued. Comment on something they did and why it mattered. I love this one. Send a physical note. One of my mainstays is never, my an angelism, never underestimate the power of a handwritten note. Because when I get a handwritten note, I am so touched by it still. Still, it brings up an emotion. So never underestimate that. Be curious and then be truly interested in how they are doing and what they're doing. Check in beyond the to-do list. I love that one, beyond the to-do list. Leave a gift card for dinner for them if that's something that you're capable of doing. Then nothing says I appreciate you more than don't do the dishes or cook tonight, go out to dinner. Um, top, talk up what they've done at meetings and give specific details. Be a bra brag about them, absolutely. Ask about their aspirations and dreams. Uh, we, have, we, we believe in that a lot in my department. Um, open up about your story, what moves you and why you do what you do. That can be very impactful. And acknowledge when you make a mistake. Guess what? You're human. Oh my gosh. I know nobody else wants to hear that, but you're human. So I love this. What if everyone had, everyone in the world had an awesome manager? Remember, Think, I want mean, to think about this, the quality of the relationship between an individual employee and their immediate supervisor is the single most driver of engagement. So all of you at the very beginning, when you were thinking about who was that incredible manager for you, that person probably cared about you. That person wanted you to grow. They gave you confidence. They gave you all of those amazing things that you possess today. They shared, your, they, they shared their gift with you. And if you want to manage your manager, and have them be successful, which in turn helps you be successful, then you need to give them the gift of you. And you need to do that every single day that you can. Show that you care, become genuinely interested in your managers as people with valuable skills, not people with skills that are valuable and place value on their well-being. And I promise you, you'll get the results that you're looking for. All right, so here are some of my sources in here. Oh my gosh, I don't know if you guys are, um, if any of you are um, subscribing to Smart Brief on Leadership, but that is a gem. There's some amazing stuff in there. So in the in the chat, oh, you're so welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you guys are liking this because I love it too. Every time I get a chance to do these, I get so excited. So I, I do thank everybody who's here. I will make sure that this is available to Jeanette so that she can get this out to you. I know that um, Anonymous, um, you asked me um, um, the question about how you can have somebody gain confidence. Why don't you approach them with, hey, let's do a user's manual on you. Let's see what I can learn about you to help, to help get you where we all need us, where we all want you to be. That might be, a, I think that might be a really great way to start that. All right. Okay, everybody. Well, my time is up. Oh, I'm glad it was a great session. Oh, thank you, AJ. That's my colleague. Thank you. Um, Denise, yes, wherever you're on your journey, we need reminders on how to do better. You are so welcome. I need reminders. That's why I love doing these. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I always enjoy my, my SCAMF audiences. I appreciate you all so much. We're all in this together in the same industry. We're all here to make lives better. And if we can do that through um, just a little bit of, you know, one, one webinar at a time, then, then we're absolutely doing that. So thank you very much. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Angel. And thanks everyone. And we'll get out the recording and slides later today. Great. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.